My guests today are Jason Gore and Jeff Garlock. Jason Gore is a comedian, writer, actor, and voiceover artist based in Los Angeles, California. Jason was a veteran performer at UCB Theater in New York and has appeared on Difficult People and in videos for Adult Swim, Above Average, and IFC. He has also done voice work for Marvel, Warner Brothers, Heineken Ways, and the cult classic animated feature film, The Spine of Night. Jeff is a writer, musician, and a holder of many buckets. His work has appeared on Adult Swim, IFC, MTV, SNL Weekend Update, Wondery, Revolver Magazine, and many other places lost to the ages of time and the content gods. He has also written nine children's graphic novels called Pup Detectives under a pen name because he is a man of mystery. Now back to Jason. He is also the co-executive producer of The Best Show with Tom Sharpling. Plus, he also co-hosts, produces, and writes for Meet My Friends, The Friends with Tom Sharpling. Meanwhile, Jeff does the Canon Canon podcast where he talks about the films created by the Canon Film Group. Jason's nickname in high school was Slaw Dog, and he is a member of the Four Horsemen. And Jeff was a bass player in the influential hardcore band Orchid. But together in the podcast world, Jason and Jeff are the creators of 108.9 The Hawk, an improvised classic rock comedy podcast that rules. And it is my great pleasure to welcome the Revolutions Per Movie, Jason Gore and Jeff Garlock. Hi, Katie's. Hey, Hello. hey. I just want to say the bio that we sent you did not mention that 108.9 The Hawk rules. So I just want to make that clear to everyone. No, 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 no. I put in a last did second edit. That in, I just Jeff? want to make Good. sure. Good. Good. A little trademark next to Wonderful. it. Wonderful. It's yes. like yeah. the podcast that rules. That rules. <laughs> we already say that we're the world's greatest podcast about a fictional classic rock radio station. And I kind of think that we're like, already kind of given it a little too much by saying world's greatest. <laughs> but I, have you thought of another one that is greater than ours? I then I I, I don't. It doesn't Thank exist. Thank you. Yeah, then we, we are. Okay, then it's apt. It works. One in Norway or something. It's you much know, like better somewhere. than ours. Oh, it's so yeah. good. It's, <laughs> yeah. 106 point the schlug. The perfect thing about you guys picking the whose kids are all right uh-huh. is, and first of all, people are going to be very jealous that you got it. You know, this <laughs> is a heard, film yeah, that yeah. that people there are certain films that people are like, can I have Gimme Shelter? Taken. Can I have yeah. Decline of Western Civilization too? Taken. Taken. Kids, all right, this is yours. Yeah. But you know, you have a fictional podcast about this world you've created, Val Verde. Mm-hmm. And what were your influences in terms of creating a world like you did, which has Different types of broadcasters, different types of commercials, different types of businesses. Jeff, you go first, because uh, I, I know where I'm coming from here. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think it was just like a little bit of the culmination of all of the main things I would gravitate towards being a sketch comedian for many years, whether it be local commercial style of Mr. Show that also led into Tim and Eric Awesome Show. Great job. Uh, uh, style and then, uh, honestly, like the nerdiest answer, but like SCTV, like oh, picturing yeah. Melonville, totally. and I uh, honestly like Garth Marenghi's Dark Place always ends up being just like the biggest influence for everything for me, where it's just like <laughs> this encapsulated world for almost no one. Like, right. I mean, that is why we, uh, you know, have our catchphrase that I coined of alienating through specificity because i do think that's been most of my (laughs) career it's just like here is something i hope it's for a lot of people but this is exactly how me and jason's brain works together in the craziest way possible yeah i think that like uh it, it comes in a different direction for for me you know i worked in classic rock radio for many years and I think that's one of the things that kind of gives 108.9 The Hawk like a real radio sound because I was an imaging director for 105.3 The Bear in Southwest Virginia and 96 Rock in Atlanta, Georgia. Amazing. And so I did like the you know, 96 Rock back crack, home of the Braves. <laughs> and so I would do all that down there and um, and I missed it. But I didn't really miss radio pay, you know, because okay. the the DJs, like, it's the funniest thing. Like when you're working in radio and you run into a fan like at a bar, they're like, oh, man, let me get your drinks, man. I, of course, I don't have to because you're rolling in that that radio bucks. And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm making all of eight dollars an hour uh, <laughs> to do this. So I thought like all these different ways 
to do radio again without having to actually do it again. And, you know, I've been doing comedy in New York for so many years. And I knew, knew Jeff through UCB Theater in New York, and we both had very similar sensibilities. I think what happened was in the early pandemic, I started a Twitter account called Good Rock Facts. Right. I remember that. And Jeff was writing on it and doing it with me. And was, so was our buddy Alex Cordellis, who's also a really great, uh, really great uh, comedic writer. And he was he's been on the Hawk before on a yes. very funny episode. And like many pandemic things, there was a way to save our sanity. Yes. Like, yeah, I, it was one of the six text chains I had going at all times was right. jokes about classic rock. Yeah. Just like coming up with the dumbest things that we could think of in terms of like, you know, the Rolling Stones recorded parts of Exile on Main Street at uh, Six Flags. And, when yeah. you know, I would doctor the picture to show like Keith in front of us right at Six Flags. Lots of Steely Dan in the pocket jokes. So much early like, on. Yeah. Well, even today I wake up and it's John and Paul. They're the fathers of podcasting. They are the fathers of podcasting. They had a Manson <laughs> podcast. And the first hour is them catching up. And the second yeah. hour is them talking about the Manson family. And they're like, yeah. he, was, he was a bad man. It's just incredible the world you've built. Uh, Jason, did your voice change when you got into radio? Did did you ever talk <laughs> differently? Uh, something stuck with you? No. Because so, that world is so intriguing to me. So I was a media studies student in college. I was a, I went to college, Radford University in Radford, Virginia, and I went there as a double music major. I was music business and music education because I was going to be a band director. That's what okay. I wanted to do. And then, like, I got really sick of playing classical music all the time. I just wanted I just wanted to play jazz, man. <laughs> and I. I, and then I got really involved with the college radio station, WVRU, and I became their ops manager. And the more fun I had doing radio, the more I was like, okay, this is what I should be doing. So I switched over to media studies. I did all that. And then while I was still in college, I got a full-time job as a radio DJ at 105.3 The Bear. So I'm doing like college by day, night shift at night like and that's foghead on the valley's rock station 105.3 the bear jason Gorin here with you until midnight coming up robbie rags broadcasting live from big owls in blacksburg we'll send a signal over there but right now rush on the bear, the bear. Oh my um God. it's terrifying how quick he can turn in <laughs> what do yeah. they call what's the term that they call that where you have to hit the mark hit the post hit the post, hit the post. right and uh he's much better at it than i am because I did it for years. Because you did it for years. I, I know what I know. I could probably tell you the length of certain posts, you know? It's like my beautiful mind. You're yeah. like seeing it like three dimensional. So I go into that voice and I think I've gone into that voice so much that I'm permanently stuck in that voice. <laughs> I do think, you know, you were talking a, a second ago about the influences for the Hawk for me when it started. Like, you know, Tom's a huge influence on sure. 108.9 The Hawk and especially you know, the the lore of New Bridge that John and Tom have put together for so many years. I yeah. think for me, the hawk kind of came out of the downtime between Meet My Friends, The Friends seasons. Okay. And I wanted to still do something that like itch that Meet My Friends, The Friends improvised, but still like you know, we say the Hawk is an improvised podcast, and it is in terms of when we're talking to the guests and everything. But we do have like written bits. We have an idea of what we want the story to kind of be for that episode, but it usually goes like the entire, the completely other direction quickly. You should see the plans that Jason has. Oh yeah, for like I've... twenty episodes down, and I always go, "Yeah, sure, we'll get there, maybe." <laughs> Do you go to your guests and say, hey, mm -hmm. we want you to do a lost music documentary about Huey Lewis and the news? <laughs> or do they yeah. come to you or does that just come out in the moment? 99% of it. I mean, we present an option off of just like you can be a character that you create. You can uh, be yourself. Go, go be yourself or go off a list we have. Mm -hmm. Most okay. people come in with something and we're just like, whatever you give us, that will become our canon. So, yeah. like, there are businesses that exist in Valverde that are just from 
not even the thing they brought in, but something they improvised that came off of something we didn't plan. And then we're like, yeah, there it is. That exists now. My buddy Adam Maid, who's one of my favorite people in the world, and I was uh, on a sketch team for a very long time in New York City called Bridge and mm-hmm. Tunnel with him and with my wife. And, uh, you know, we had one show that was uh, all request liquid lunchtime. And, you know, Danny Grace and Marshall Stratton, uh, Danny was also on Bridge and Tunnel and Adam would call in. They called in as the callers, all okay. requ- all requesting Aerosmith's ragdoll to kind of just keep pushing <laughs> us until we would break. Um, but Adam came up with Jug's Mug Emporium and he just mentioned it randomly. And now Jug's Mug Emporium basically has a spot on every show. Oh, yeah. Right, where we just list the random mugs that they're selling that week. You're like, stuck. I'm, yeah, I wrote so, what I just walk around writing jugs down. Yes. I saw someone wear yes. a shirt that said exercise. I thought you meant French fries. <laughs> well, I had a and question I was like, about... that doesn't work. That's a jug. <laughs> yeah. well, I have a question about the things that circle around in it. What made you pick Richie Blackmore? Oh, God. As you know, because I, I was wondering about this, about classic rock. It is uh-huh. kind of the most fun genre to poke holes in. 100 percent. But what, what made you pick Richie Blackmore as this? Happy birthday goalpost yeah. that you always have. <laughs> I I think we, I mean, I don't even, that's the thing is honestly, we truly might have like a weird just mind meld, me and Jason, I, yeah. for where our brains go. But I think, uh-huh. I think we both were at the time, I think I just said, what if we never, we, what if we always were only saying happy birthday to yes. Richie? And that was on Good Rock Facts. That, that was, was on, on Good, Good Rock, Rock Facts, Facts before the even show. And I think right. it was just the logic this is what would happen as even like I was a sketch teacher for eight and a half years. And I'd be like, you have to explain your sketches. But then I was like, my logic doesn't make any sense. I think right. my logic was Richie is so guarded and you can't get any interviews that like I don't even I, I would be surprised if I even knew his birthday. And so then in, and I think also is Jason had found such a funny photo of him uh-huh. looking extra pissed yes. but in Blackmore's night era. So like that was just like. Ag- like who would be the least happy we're wishing him happy birthday all the time and then he just became one of those rockers on the hawk that we talk about all the time like right. i would say the classic rock staples that we joke about the most on 108.9 the hawk mm-hmm. so if you've never listened to the show and you're listening to this podcast and you're like oh i that those bands make me laugh i think i would like the hawk we make so much fun of aerosmith I so love Aerosmith, yes. but and I, I we make so much fun of Aerosmith. It's also, by the way, part of our dynamic, and you'll probably see even on today's episode of oh, your yeah. podcast, like, yeah. I've got my complicated like opinions. And- oh, and he already told me last night, he's like, I'll have some things to <laughs> I'm say. I'm a lovable curmudgeon. Good. But right. Aerosmith, right. Uh, Steely Dan, Steely in the Dan. pocket. In the uh, pocket, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Deep Purple, Because There's Mocks. Right, we make, so I think we just make fun the of all the different of lineups. Mox comes up a lot. Jethro uh, Tull, Ian Jethro Anderson Tull. shows up a lot. Oh, what's Steve, his name? Uh, Steve from, Winwood shows up a lot. Steve Winwood. I mean, Eric Clapton's probably the number one of shitting on that aspect. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We shit on Eric Clapton left and right. Jimmy Page is a character. Same with Jeff Lynne from ELO. Ray Manzarek. Yeah, Ray, we make Can't so much fun of Ray Manzarek. Can't get away from making fun of Ray Manzarek. <laughs> oh, we make so much Easy fun target. of the doors. Yeah, it's so just all of, of the, the anger and hatred that I know I've had to certain personalities over the years always yeah. bubbles back up. Jason, there's got to have been something when you were working in that, that it was the last thing you wanted to hear was another Deep Purple song, maybe in the middle at 3 a.m. of the night. But I do feel like that there's this kind of, I don't feel like it's a mean-spirited blanket across this genre. I feel like there's there's definitely some love to it. Oh, yeah. Even... 100% love. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's what makes the show work. You know the genre. Mm-hmm. You've lived in the genre. But you're also like, I've ate this genre so much. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I I've, need to just get this out of me. I mean, the rule the rule of teaching parody that comes out and then people fight against it and like a no poking the dead frog thing. But it's like you, it, it helps to like to love the thing you're making fun of mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. then you actually know what you're talking about. So Shaun of the Dead makes sense. Like, yeah, Spinal Tap right. makes sense because they are musicians. Like, even if it's not right. their preferred genre. Like, I don't like journey but i mm-hmm. love the concept of journey and yeah, i sure. love journey and i in in the sense that when i hear a song i'm just like oh yeah i'm on a boat on clater lake 
in the New River Valley, just like speeding around, and it's like wheel in the sky. Like you can't hate that. No, it's, it's not a great something song. That, I love yeah, Journey. Yeah, I, so, well, see, I don't yeah. hate them, but they're not like one of those bands. And I will say that you know we do a deep dive on one hundred eight point nine The Hawk. We have a separate podcast that's part of our universe uh, called Hawk Rock Talk, where we do you know right. break down like bands. We went through the entire you know. Uh, discography of Genesis, of Queen, of uh, Van Halen. And, you know, we also break it down to classic albums. And our first classic album that we did was Boston, which that first record of Boston, you can't get away from that. That will no. chase you down the street if you're listening to a classic rock radio station. Every single song literally is a classic rock radio Every number one single. Every single song. It, which, it shocked us yeah. as we went through it. We we're like, oh, wait, this one, too. Yeah. Let me take I mean, you home tonight. <laughs> you know, they're they're still even playing that. I think know? for me, the thing that I and it and to me it also connects to your podcast and documentaries. Like I I have a problem in the thing that like a, a lot of those targets come from making fun of the narrative. Like sure. I get very frustrated with the narrative of classic rock. And for classic rock radio, that's why I always say, if you give us a five star rating, let us know what song has been ruined by classic rock. Because yeah. according to classic rock, there are only two Black Sabbath songs. There are only when it comes right. to Boston, eight for the LP. But like there are only three Journey songs and like, you know, Thin Lizzy is a band that for years I would have said, I do not like Thin Lizzy because I have mm -hmm. only heard the boys are back in town. And. As jailbreak. Jason knows, Thin Lizzy and Jailbreak. And Thin Lizzy is one of my favorite bands. Yeah, they're of amazing. All time. Every album yes. from the beginning and I into agree. Thunder and Lightning. It is an amazing record. Yeah, Robert Pollard turned me on to them when I was in Gotta Buy Voices. He was, yeah. I just, he, I didn't know Little Girl in Bloom. Yeah. And um, Honesty is an Excuse. And all these, all these amazing records from like this kind of like, Three piece stuff to like the double guitar metal thing. I yeah. love it all. It's the same to me as documentaries. Like according to documentaries, there are it, the lineage. The lineage of how rock worked always worked that way. Led Zeppelin showed up, and then metal started. Like, right. and it's hard because it's like I know there's no room to talk about Sir Lord Baltimore, like <laughs> in these proto metal bands. But we do also like we do go to like the other for like if if you listen to the hawk we are talking about like fringe artists every now and then like we had a what was the what was the BTO what was the the Barclay James place? Harvest Bachman oh Turner Overdrive Grilled we'll get Cheese together, Shop yeah Grilled Cheese Shop and you know because we, that's the hard part for me Jason is able to tether me like yeah. I my brain doesn't <laughs> understand that not everyone has a Barclay James Harvest joke in their back pocket. Right, right. Like when I'm talking even about like, you know, Robbie Agatocles Dalton is the son of uh, <laughs> our boss, boss, boss Ron, man, boss Ron. And he is an extreme metal fan who has a TV, uh, has a show only at three 15 in the morning for 15 minutes. And he's always playing porno grind and like obscure French black metal that might be like questionable in its politics. Yeah, right. And he, Jason doesn't know what I'm talking about. And no he doesn't know if I'm making up about. bands or if Despel Omega is a band yeah. that I have too many opinions on. Right. <laughs> That's where our fun comes together. <laughs> While we get into the talk of the who's the kids are all right, could you do a post into our discussion? All right, here we go. Now, there was a movie that came out in 1979, Jeff. It's a great movie. It's all, I always like watching a film. Uh, 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 ordinary People. Uh, no, no, no. It is the I hit. thought we were going to talk about Ordinary People on a classic rock radio. Are, that's, what, that's what people tune in every morning to hear right here. Uh, one way point nine the hot. But we are talking about The Kids Are All Right. With Starring Mark Ruffalo. No, what a no, movie. no, no, no. The, the, with, with The Who. We're talking Pete oh, Townsend. Who? John and Twist. What are what are the zodiac symbols of the members of the Who? Well, we've got the uh You got the ox. The we ox. already got that one. You got the lion you for Daltry. The lion okay, he's the lion. Moon um, is the drunkard, I believe. The is there drunkard. an animal called the that drunkard? Is, it's and just the drunkard. It could be it's any just animal. The drunkard. It's just type of a lizard. My favorite thing about the kids are all right is any you know, you get so many great performances, and then you get all of these interview the ed interview segments with the Who, where they clearly hate it. They hate every they do moment. I want to be there. there. <laughs> they hate being in the Who. 
And, and, you know, you start to hate watching them hate being in the Who. And that's the fun part of it. I will say that was the biggest thing. I rewatched it last night. And this yes. is the best way, guys. If you're going to if you want to watch along, I recommend this. Pop a melatonin. Oh. Lay in bed and watch it. And you're just like, what? <laughs> I recommend watching on YouTube as I did and that the volume of Kids Are All Right is very low. Yeah, and that's the volume of the commercials is piercingly loud. <laughs> yeah, well, it's so funny because when I saw this film on VHS, it was like mm-hmm. an edited version of this. It didn't have everything in it, and so it was it was incomplete. Yeah, I remember that VHS. Yeah, it's because at the time, you know, you could only pick or choose a few things that you could find in your local video store yep. to rent that were music, you know, oriented. Maybe The Wall and this film, Woodstock. But it was really slim pickings in the music department. You know, they'd have that yeah. row where it'd be like dance, art, and music. So it'd be oh. like how to paint, yeah, like Pink yeah. Floyd's The Wall VHS, you know, maybe this. Roger Waters' Berlin Wall performance of The Wall on VHS. Right. You get that easier. They'd have that. Right. That's, that's in more often. Yeah. yeah. But this film yes. was my entryway into The Who mm-hmm. as a child. Did you guys know about The Who before you saw this? Were you obsessed with The Who? Where, what are your personal connections with The Who? Because I got a feeling we're going to get some nice opinions yeah. here. I can, yeah, see, I, think, uh, I can see there's some opinions Real Siskel Lieber right here. Yeah. All right, Jason, you start. I The Who wasn't one of my first classic rock bands that I loved. Like, I loved Queen early on. I loved Queen as okay. a very little child because my mom would play the game album a lot. Um, so I really got into Queen. And then, you know, you hit middle school. And you suddenly somebody's like, hey, man, have you ever heard of Zeppelin? And they, you know, or and, or and then or they try to show you how to play dazed and confused on a bass. Right. And it's just like, oh, my God, I play bass now. Right. And uh, so, you know, like Zeppelin kiss. And once you're going through all that, you move over to Aerosmith and the who found their way in there. I remember a friend had purchased uh, meaty, bitty, big and bouncy. Yeah. The, uh, I think, what is that, 71? Did that come out in 71 collection? That may be right, but it's it's they're looking in the rearview mirror at that, yeah. that material by this point. 100%. It had stuff like Substitute and pictures of Lily and right. uh, Boris the Spider, and I just couldn't get enough of it. And then right around that time, I think it was 94 for me, was when uh, that uh, Maximum R&B box set came out. And so I got that. I was obsessed with that. You know, watching kids and the kids are all right. I always kind of mix up some of the performances in my head versus what was on that maximum R&B VHS, too, because it had a lot of really great uh, performances on that as well. Uh, But those were just two movies that I would just watch over and over. And like being in a band, you're trying to like you're learning from that. You're learning how to rock. It, it just, you know, I loved it so much. I would rent it so much at King Video in Radford, Virginia. Same edited tape that, you, that you're talking about. Yeah. So when it actually came out on DVD and you see all the, the everything, it right. was uh, pretty mind blowing. But yeah, they were always a very, very, you know, they're up there with the Beatles for me. They're up there with the Queen. They're, you know, and then when that extent, when that expanded uh, Live at Leeds came out, not the two disc, but just the one disc that had more songs on it. Um, it just blew my mind. It's still still my favorite live album, hands down. And this is probably my favorite music documentary, even though I will I have some thoughts on it, and we'll we'll get into those. Yeah. But uh, Jeff, where are you with the Who? I mean, yesterday was the first time I'd ever watched The Kids Are All Right. Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. And and because you know, for me, classic rock is something that connects to our podcast or anything. But like, I had to like re-enter into during college and post-college uh you know for me the who i was realizing this and this would come up when we will do the who uh hawk rock talk i'm sure the who was definitely a band that was uh couldn't get a chance for me because it was ruined by classic rock radio like i can only kind of picture those songs being sung half-heartedly by my mother with all of the like energy sucked out of it. Like, so your mom's like uh, walking down the hall, like teenage wasteland. Hey, when Jeff. who are you came on when she was just here, it just reminded me she was visiting. It was just like, who, 
uh, you. It's just like just singing like a mom <laughs> Wait, to it. Wait, is she and singing I'm like, the chorus or is she singing the ooh-wah, ooh-wah, ooh-wah part? Which part is it, Jeff? No parts, just oh, okay. her own version of yeah. it. <laughs> well, she was no, in because the who, She was so. feeling the spirit, Jason. Oh, yes. good. I love it. Uh, but yeah, so for me, like, you know, most of the classic rock band, but the Who definitely fell in that where it's just like they are a band that is played on 99 Rock WPLR while I am picking weeds, like, mm-hmm. and, you know, getting yelled at by my dad. Like, because while Jason was watching this every week, I was, it, look, honestly, if it, at first, if it wasn't Primus or Weird Al, I wasn't paying attention to anything. Yeah. And then very quickly, it was like, Jason's watching this, I'm watching the skinny puppy. VHS right. and the I'm Ministry VHS that. and the Dead Kennedys Target bootleg that I bought in the Black Flag and then very quickly like you know getting into just hardcore they were also a band that when I was in my band Panthers the Who would come up sometimes as like wondering if we were influenced at least by the live music version of them like the concert versions of them because some people would be like, oh, you play like Entwistle. And I was like, I don't even really know what that means completely. <laughs> like, Oh, shit, like, totally. Uh, because I think I was just aggressively playing with maybe a couple more notes and right. like a little bit of, you know, fuzz on it. And like, Do you and... finger pick or use a pick? No, I, I pick. So that's the thing. Like, okay. I was like, I'm thinking of David Sims. Like, right, yes. Jesus Lizard and Chris Squire and John Wetton and yeah. Jared from Carp. And big business now unwound. Like I was right. like, that's what I was picturing. But they were pro- possibly picturing John Entwistle, like the Ox. I was in the ultimate Who band that gets guided by voices oh, all God. the time. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you couldn't get away from it. Oh yeah, I mean, right. Pollard. You know, in terms of writing, in terms yep. of like attitude, in terms of humor, in yep. terms of microphone swinging, leg kicks. It was like. <laughs> yeah. Could not escape that. And I more come from your world, Jeff. Like, I was like a new wave, post-punk, punk, punk, hardcore baby. Well, it would be really interesting to talk about, like, what you think in terms of the spirit of The Who. Because the film is really weird. It was put together by this American fan, Jeff Stein, Mm -hmm. who uh, had no previous experience being a director or producer. He had worked with them when he was a teenager putting together like a tour program. And he kind of pitched Pete Townsend this idea of, I want to tell the story through archival footage. And Townsend was kind of not into it. But his management was like, hey, you don't want to tour anymore. This is your tour. This will be, this will buy you some time. And so he kind of put together a little promo reel for them and showed it to them. And they, the band like freaked out because Mm -hmm. they just forgotten just how, first of all, how young they were. They were kind of amazed, like especially Keith Moon was really freaked out at how much he had aged in a short period of time. He really and did. by the time this came we out- We all were, Keith. <laughs> yeah. He had seen the original edit mm-hmm. and he died a week later. He'd given approval and they basically said, we don't want to touch this. We don't want it to be a memory of, hey, now it's all the Keith Moon story. Let's, right, right. let's build that up. It's just so weird to look at him and be like, he's 32? Yeah. It's interesting when a band looks backwards after such a short period of time, you know? He, he was 32 when he passed? God almighty. Yeah. You you look at him in that footage, and you're just like, this is a 48-year-old man. Yeah, Like, easily. his skin is leathery. Like, I mean, but he had done so much drugs and so much drinking yeah. For he did he did the 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 drinking and drugs for you know 2000 men. Yeah. It's yeah. Insane. Um yeah, I that's one thing I will say watching this I I was very shocked looking at Mooney and yeah. seeing how like when they would go back like anywhere anyhow any anyway, you know, that footage and he's just back there so young. And uh it's it's just unbelievable to see and then at the end he's just like He's just, he's grizzled. He's, you know, he's got a beard, but he's always very funny. My favorite thing of watching The Who live is watching Moon play and just like kind of sing along, but also he's talking to these other spirits around him. 
And you're like, whiskey what is, ghost is looking what at him. Is he and talk, <laughs> who is he talking like, to? You've got a week left. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're telling him, oh, back, screw you. Pack it up, Moon. You've got one week left. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it was shocking just to see them all age. Uh, he died four months after the Shepperton sessions. Right. So, you know, you're really seeing them. And, and, the, and that kind of hit me hard because I don't think that really uh, weighed on me as much as a kid. And now I'm like an older dude. Absolutely. And thinks more about mortality and Why? stuff. <laughs> just because I'm an older dude. I don't yeah, know. I've never thought crazy. about that. I just constantly yeah. am loving life. Yeah, why would you bring that Be up? present, bro. But you can. <laughs> it was so funny, especially the session like where they're playing Barbara Ann. They're covering Barbara Ann. <laughs> oh my! By the God. Beach Boys. And he does that lift up is the funniest thing yes. ever. When he's like, "Baby, get in the right yes, key." Yes. You're supposed to be singing. <laughs> but you could see them just playing around and having like it could have fizzled out, but he kept it going to where yeah. you know Townsend just starts riffing and doing the you know. The uh, the the Chuck Berry kick walk across yeah. the stage and you could just see how much fun uh, they were having. And I think I've always thought if there were two bands I could go back in time and see, I would have loved to have seen that lineup of The Who. And I would have loved to have seen, you know, of course, Queen with Freddie Mercury. I was just going to say for me, seeing it the first time, I actually thought I was like, oh, this is a pretty incredible documentary. Like, I think the filmmaker being young and not knowing what they were doing in theory, right. if that's the narrative that we're going to buy, and I'll buy into it, why not, leads to it being a very interesting documentation, but also narrative, because there is always a narrative that is brought in by the editing in documentaries. And in in this one, the intercutting is super interesting. Like the, It actually brings out this band that seems like they were so guarded mm -hmm. in what their deal was. And then these slight moments he pulls out where you're like, whoa, that's like the most truthful thing I've seen out of all of these band members. And it's kind of haunting, especially when it comes to like Moon. Yeah. Um, and, and, it, and it seems like possibly the director doesn't even know he did it. And you're like, well, that adds to this kind of like, punk quality to me that he like mm -hmm. stumbled into oh wow keith moon is sitting there going oh now you want the truth that's gonna actually cost you this has all been a lie this is a fallacy like right. i made up and you're like that's an interesting moment like that is that's the that's more truthful than everything we've watched here which was kind of beautiful i will say though that i do think there was a lot of truth in terms of like the clips with 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 pete townsend talking about how yes. Like he doesn't see them as good musicians or anything. It's just it's a show. But I think that's to me why the editing of it and like maybe that amateur to him, but didn't come across the amateur quality of pulling out because you're not getting that moment out of a full interview. Right. You're literally getting that moment intercut with a song where they're we're watching them create an artifice on stage that isn't an artifice they are a band that watching them at their best seem like they're on the verge of collapsing and it seems completely in their control the film is is jumping timelines it's going yes. back and forth it's all over the place i kind of appreciated that it, it did leap around like that so yeah you're right when pete townsend is talking it's a voiceover and they're showing footage of them that is not related to the interviews, but I love that they have like Ken Russell out of his mind talking about oh. <laughs> the who just being like, you know, the most yeah. important thing in, in the world, practically. That jean jacket, too. My God. Oh, my that God. That jean jacket's out of its mind. Jesus. That, yeah. yeah, that God. jean jacket has a fucking mind of its own. It's all bedazzled <laughs> and just. That jean jacket made the devils. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> but it's so funny because also this is an era where bands, especially from that from the UK, British Invasion bands also had to be funny as shit, mm -hmm. clever. They all, every band was like, we're hilarious. You gotta be Monty Python light. <laughs> like, Wait, do, do you think the Stones were hilarious though? I don't think the no, Stones were funny. They weren't, but I guarantee you, if you watch those interviews from Gimme Shelter even, mm -hmm. Mick Jagger thinks he's hilarious. <laughs> you know, they think they're funny. But he wasn't genuinely funny. Like, the Who was genuinely no, funny. They, the Kinks were genuinely funny. 
Exactly. When you hear stories of Jagger on SNL, like the behind the scenes, you're like, oh, right. He thinks he's he thinks he's hilarious. hilarious. Yeah, totally. But he, yeah. yeah. But you're putting up with Jagger a little right, bit because right. he's Jagger. No, it's amazing. Even recently they had, uh, you know, the Stones have that new album out. So they've been doing all this press. And right. Jimmy right. Fallon stuff. And it is they just don't have that connection even when Jagger looks over to Keith and it's like hey wasn't that right or like a little aside there's just a disconnect the, the who maybe if Moon was still around and they were on stage together there would be a disconnect too yeah. but in this film they're just like one unit they're like a four headed beast when I watched this as a kid I always thought is the of the who as a very happy unit and this was before I even read a lot about the who and like learning about their differences and everything. So I watching this again for me this time felt a little bit more like watching the original Let It Be for oh, the first wow. time where you see the cracks. Interesting. Yeah. Like I can see in Entw Entwistle really not being very uh uh very interested in it. And I can see You can see this from Townsend. Once right. his arms cross, you're like, "Oh, he's he's sick of Keith right now. You can you can see the tension that still exists to this day with the only two remaining who members, Roger Daltrey yeah, and yeah. Pete Townsend. Like that tension that it exists today is exactly the same way it's been throughout the, the entire history of the who. Like the who was, you know, when they they started out, they were doing good, but they weren't really making much money. The band was going to break up until they did Tommy. They do Tommy, they start seeing some success and start getting some money. And, you know, they, they stay they stay in this band. But I, I never really felt like I always thought like, oh, they're they all love each other like the Beatles love each right. other. And watching it this time, I felt like, oh, man, they were just in it because they didn't have anything else to do. They were stuck in the who. I mean, that's the interesting part of watching it for me as a 45 year old man watching it for the first time, but years of band experience. And then you watching it as like youthful fan of just like, they just love each <laughs> other. Love and each now other. you're watching and, it as like, Oh, alcoholism is a rough right. thing. Like humanity is a tough thing. Like what? Like interconnectivity is a real tough thing. Like, this is also one of the reasons why, like many people, but that Beatles documentary is my favorite Beatles thing as someone who doesn't care that much about the Beatles, like because it was like, there's there it is. OK, mm -hmm. I get that part of being in a yeah. band like the only reason uh, uh, people don't know that I got into a screaming match with my drummer outside of a casino in Vegas <laughs> is because a camera was not there to document what is a pretty normal right. thing for young people who mm -hmm. don't know how to deal with the world and have to deal with the world and be shoved into a van. Right. Uh, and, and, and a lot of this was like watching it as just like, whew, I hear you, man. Like, it was just a lot of like, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, I felt that tension. And you bring up a really good point. Like, I, when I watched this as a kid, I never looked at it through that alcoholism lens. And, you know, my dad was an alcoholic. He, it killed him. And I did get those feelings from this again, seeing Moon. Like a lot yeah. of the times Moon talked, he was doing things very similar to the way my dad was. Mm, right. And that kind of hit home where it was just like, oh, Jesus, the, he's killing himself. Yeah. Right. He is killing himself. And it was hard to watch. And, you know, that's one thing I really love about the Beatles Get Back is, you know, Let It Be was so hard to watch as a Beatles fan. Because oh, you're like, brutal. these guys want to slit each other's throats. I'm going to have to watch this. I've never watched it out there. Oh, the original Let It Be. Brutal. There's no breathing room in it. No. It is dark. It feels underlit. It just feels like you're in a bunker with them. Yeah. And you're not allowed to go get any fresh air for a week with the Beatles. And it even, it even tinted the way the Beatles remembered it, too. Because I was reading stories about when Get Back came out. Um, or, you know, Peter Jackson had his first cut of Get Back and he wanted to show McCartney uh, backstage at a show. McCartney was like, I have no interest watching this because I don't want to feel bad. Oh, wow. And, he, and Peter Jackson was like, no, seriously, look at what we found. 
And watching Get Back for me as a lifelong Beatles fan, like I teared up watching those moments where they're having such a wonderful time together. I want to taste that tea so bad. Oh, the the fucking it seems bread. like it's got to be the best cup of ever. The bread, like, like the bread, the bread that looks Ma- the so toast good. That Mal Evans keeps bringing in. All you know, I think about watching think, that oh, freaking it's thing. Best. It's the best, and it's like you know these moments where you like, oh my god, you see the love there. Yeah. Making Spike Jones jokes nonstop. Yeah, and like Peter Sellers walks in, he's like, "I gotta get the fuck out of here." How we doing yeah, over yeah. here? <laughs> but I didn't see that love in this movie, which hurt me. Jeff, I want to ask. Yeah, are you a fan of the Who? This is a very good question. I would like to ask this question too, Jeff. Are you a fan of the Who? <sighs> it's a complicated fan, though. I would say, <laughs> welcome to my world. Chris. Well, here's the prop. Welcome yeah. to my world. Um, I mean, to to. I think part of the answer is my favorite era is right at the end. My favorite era would be the that main footage, like where is that the last footage that we're watching? So you're watching like seventy eight footage. Is yeah, the, is like like your the live stuff and who 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 are you? Yeah, where I'm like, oh, I'm going to be interested in what Towns is doing solo, uh-huh. um, because you know Jason has heard this. One of the problems with the who is that like I I don't have much of a reverence for British Invasion slash Skiffle. Um, I don't. Oh, he love... hates skiffle. Yeah, don't get I him don't start. Love skiffle. Don't... The Who has skiffle all over it. It's just dripping with over, skiffle. Baby. You start talking to Jeff about Lonnie Dunn again, and he just skiffle. loses his fucking mind. The who has no skiffle? Sir. There's no skiffle in the Who. Go ahead, please continue. We'll go just British invasion then. Fair little, enough. Little skiffle. Yeah. I'll get, yeah. uh, uh, I don't. As Jason knows, I don't love like when it gets just like straight blues, and you know, luckily Townsend can't really play that. He got his own weird playing style. Right. Yes. I realized I also this time I had a problem with the who in that I was uh, in college. I was bummed with this kind of mod resurgence uh, in especially Boston, but amongst hardcore kids. I get kids. that. Yeah, no, I like, remember it, that. It, there was like a period where it was like half of the kids would go to hardcore shows. Half of the kids would go to this dance club to listen to Brit pop and right. uh, and buying Vespas and all that stuff. And I, it drove me nuts. It was like kind of like Nation of Ulysses becoming makeup. And I was just like, oh, but I'm a Nation of Ulysses fan. Interesting. And I don't want to watch the makeup at all. And so on record, there's just a little bit too much for me to weed through that I don't want to listen to a full record most of the time. Oh, you're going time. to, like, though. That's the thing. The I, next, I mean, uh, when we do Hawk Rock, Rock, Rock Talk, talk so. I know. Yeah. yeah. But the live stuff, I'm like, oh, this makes sense to me. This mm-hmm. fits in my wheelhouse. Interesting. But they're a hard, like, listen to a full record. It's something like Tommy also blows my mind. Again, was talking about this morning where it's the same as, you know, I love progressive rock more than anything. But I can't fathom that the world glommed on to it. Like, I can't fathom that that many people were into Tommy, The Wall, The yeah. Lamb Lives Down on Broadway. Maybe not as much. But, like, that even that Yes got so big, like, playing, like, close to the edge. It's like, really? I think this is mind bending but i and, and it was just a different time mark it but, down so, 58 minutes in he's talking yes yeah i yep, mean i got so, it like are we talking fish out of water yet though uh <laughs> oh god so good oh uh, my god uh, i love that record yeah it really is just a yeah. mind-blowing solo record i mean that is truly yeah. like well, let's have a one minute yeah. chris squire like a sidebar here start the clock start the clock uh, no truly that lucky seven is such a kind of mind bender of like having a crazy time signature but also this heartfelt like tears at my soul like song yeah. i think it might be the best yes album that's not a yes album 100%. oh i agree i agree my brother turned it on turned me on to it a couple years ago and gave it to me as a, a holiday present and i just was like where has this been yeah as as a yes fan yeah. it's like it's just a kind of a better prettier more heartfelt version of yes i think 100 it's it's, it's, like, it's the yes that i like yeah right. i mean and i love yes so much yeah like i mean like and but it's it's uh you know and, and when you get to that point we're like well i've run out of yes records i guess i'll start buying all the solo records yeah, yeah. well there's our minute there's our minute i'm sorry we can't all we right can't. But, but you know I, I, I i'm the opposite with this film Mm-hmm. I, I love seeing the who smash things and I love seeing the younger live stuff. Yeah. But things like Young Man's Blues, which is kind of oh. the lead stuff, right? I, I that doesn't do it for me. I know people really? love that stuff. Yeah. Or water or those things that is that what it's called? Water? Yeah. Those kind of like yeah. more bluesy long things. I mean, I kind of like seeing their confidence and they have a definite 
attitude and swagger in it. I like the early stuff and I mm-hmm. kind of like Quadrophenia. Yeah. And some of this stuff. But there's like this period in the middle from like after Who Sells Out to Quadrophenia that even like Who's Next, like I can, I, I like some of it, but I'm not, it's not my right. favorite record. But it's interesting because they made so few records. Yeah. I feel like everyone I talk to has a different entry point and a different love affair with it. And I rarely find somebody who loves all of it. I have a hard time with Daltrey. That maybe just, I'm thinking that just connects to the swagger part. Like, mm-hmm. I, I mean, Daltrey, because they are basically the same person in my brain, too, is like, I don't love Robert Plant. We've had this discussion. Uh, like, he's the weak part of Zeppelin to me. <laughs> oh my like, God. Uh, love it it. Drives, he kind of drives me nuts. <laughs> uh, but, uh, Jesus. Uh, but li- but what that's why the swagger going through Townsend doesn't come across as swagger. It actually just comes across as he's confused about what's going on in his private life. Like, oh, I mean, Townsend is incredible. What an amazing performer. I mean, they're all amazing performers, but Pete Townsend is just all weird performers, too. Like, True. This time I was like, I was like, it's insane. Like Keith Moon plays like a crazy person talking to weed and talking to whiskey demons. Like Townsend is trying to do this masculine butt shake, but you're like, I'm never going to fucking forget whiskey demons. He's just like, amen. <laughs> and, you know, Townsend's in his own world playing also like, you're like, that's not a blues chord. Right. That's just like a weird no. octave reverse thing. And then. And Whistle is playing with four fingers and playing. He's how could someone be so not interested in play that many and notes so high. at the same time? And well, so and Townsend high. gives off that anti-hero thing that a lot mm-hmm. of these bands didn't have. You know, a lot of them were kind of running towards that light, like, you know, in Zeppelin and things like that. And it's cool. Yeah. Like, even though Townsend would have the stance and the spotlight, he definitely had just this, like, I don't give a shit thing yeah. going through it that I just love. I'm going to blow your mind, Chris. I'm going to blow your mind by saying this. Uh, I do love it all. Okay. I love everything. I love fucking Endless Wire. And you're never going to hear anyone say that. But my favorite period is the period you just shat on, which is the Who Sellout through Quadrophenia. Now, Sellout's my favorite record. And I love Quadrophenia. I don't what? like uh, Tommy and Who's Next. I love Tommy. I love Tommy. I love Who's Next. The Who's Next Life House that just came out is fucking brilliant because I've always wanted to hear Life a House, you know, as as I need to give Sellout another chance because I think I Sellout is so good, man. I think I lump it in with Zappa like I lump it in as like it's being too like I'm just like, just do a record. Like, don't be I don't let make a satire of stuff. It's pretty awesome, though, because like it definitely. Yeah, I get what you're saying, but it if you. Like hearing that in what sixty six or sixty seven, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. just it had to have been weird as fuck. Oh you god! Yeah. And With I know Zappa, I know Zappa is doing his whole and, thing during yeah. that time, and it's like it yeah. blows it out of the water in terms of strangeness. Yeah. But in terms of a band that's like kind of a singles band, yeah, it's really the one sure. where if there's anything that with the Who that's interesting is like they definitely become as concept focused as a band like Pink Floyd did. Oh, one hundred. You know, yeah. like every album is. It's going to be this lighthouse thing. Oh, it's going to be Quadrophenia. It's going to, you know, it's just like they started really being conceptually driven. He was constantly doing that and thinking of it in that concept. Um, I love a quick one while he's away. Uh, the best performance of it ever is in, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kids yes. Are All Right, but also from the rock and like we talked about this on a best show for Horsemen a couple weeks ago where, you know, you know, the Who's rock and roll circus, the, the Who mopped the stage. With it's the incredible. Stones. The Stones set doesn't even hold up to the Who set. And that's one of the big reasons that the Rock and Roll Circus wasn't released until the 90s was they just didn't want to see, you know, they didn't want to show just how good the Who was on that. And it's funny because you watch Rock and Roll Circus and the Stones are fine. Like they're, they're, they're great. They're, they're, they're great in it. Although it is fucking hilarious when Mick Jagger takes off his shirt during sympathy and he's got a painted on devil (laughs) tattoo. That's like the worst watercolor thing. You're like, Ooh, look at me. It's like, do you think you he's just take a shower and it's gone? You are not this dark lord thing. Well, backstage he was like, "This is going to be hilarious. They're going to laugh right. about this, aren't they?" Think, right, exactly. But you know, the who definitely blew it away. But I just think it's so funny that I think it makes the Stones do their thing better. You know, in a funny way, you're like, "Oh, oh it no pushes one, them." You ask them to be on this thing. 
of course, they're going to come with a chip on their shoulder and they're going to fucking, you know, wipe everyone away. Right. And then you've got the Dirty Mac, too. You've That's got, cool, you too. Know, John Lennon singing your blues with the piece of shit Eric Clapton on guitar. I know. And, uh, you know, um, and then you've got Jethro Tull. That's killer, too. With Tony Iommi <laughs> on guitar. Yeah. Wait, what now? How have we never yeah. talked about yeah. this? this is, now That's, we're talking Garlock he, territory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then there's a weird Taj Mahal thing, too. Yeah. Which, that's the only performance that bugs me is they, they stop the thing and the guitar player in Taj Mahal goes, bum, 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 and he does this, and he, he doesn't nail it. Yeah. And you're like, oh, no. Like, his finger slips and he can't get the sustain. And then you're like, Oh, wow. There's no other <laughs> instrumentation. It all drops out for this guy to do this blues thing. And it is really gutless. And he just Everybody. fucks it up. You asked if I like Who by Numbers. I yes. do. I do. One of my favorite Who songs is on that record. I love Blue, Red, and Gray. Where, I love every minute of the day. It's one of my favorite <laughs> Sounds like Who one songs. of Jeff's favorites. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Jeff, Jeff now we're talking. It. But he just, he just ordered it off. Oh, yeah. He just, he just got... quickly ordered that off of Amazon. <laughs> um, but I will say, no, 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 you no, know, no. you were you were talking about Tommy and how, you know, um, Townsend thought Daltrey was just a working class dick bag until Tommy. <laughs> and, and Daltrey really did come into his own in the way he would be throughout the rest of the 70s. Like, Hitting yeah. those like yes and just that's like amazing chest out hair who who came up with the costume first was it Daltrey or Robert Plant to do like it's a real battle it's a real battle for I think it's I think it's Daltrey I think it is I think it's Daltrey yeah I do think it's I think Daltrey. It is Daltrey but I love that period where you know they're playing where uh. You know, Townsend tries to play the blues. He's playing a he's playing an SG through the high watt stack. Like that's my who sound. That's what I always love okay. to hear. Um, you know, but also I mean high watt stack is beautiful, by oh, the way. And God, whistle, please. I believe. It looked like he had all sun yeah, on one end. Yeah. <laughs> like and it was and then all high watt. I mean, we dealt with a high watt hundred watt uh -huh. in my one of my bands, and we were constantly like, "Could you get it down to a fifty watt yeah. for the rest yeah. of us? Because it's really painful in this club." Oh, God. And they're like, "No, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I won't." And he's like, "I'll add a yeah. third delay no. pedal." <laughs> I know what a band is being in a band is like. They're like, "No, I'm not going backwards." Yeah. Oh. It's like, "Well, I'll buy us Ampeg '70s Blue yeah. Line and make it be louder." Well, yeah. I'm curious. Uh, watching it this time, I did feel, I don't know, maybe you're going to punch me through the screen. It did feel a little okay, overly right. long. I it felt did. like there were it times yes, where 100%. I was like, it's too okay. long. Okay. Yeah. And I thought that was interesting because I I never remembered it being long. And of course, we were talking me about neither. the VHS short thing. Is there anything that you think would have, this film could have benefited from? Anything that you're like, oh, they just leaned on this too much, or I wish this this era had been represented more, or I wish there was more studio stuff. I always, I the, the biggest thing for me is this, just the Shepperton footage. Like, that's the stuff that always comes to mind. Like, when I think of Kids Are All Right, just those performances were just so goddamn solid. Um, as much as I yeah. love Barbara Ann and seeing that, like, you might not need that there. You probably don't need that dick. You probably around. don't need yeah. that dick uh, around. You probably don't need the shot of uh, the ox shooting his gold records. But it is more interesting any of that extra added stuff than the song remains the same. Which oh, one hundred percent agreed. As, as yeah. time has gone on, has gotten <laughs> I feel more validated in being in high school, being like this movie is garbage. Like oh, the song remains so the same. Stupid. Fucking sucks. <sighs> I remember I went to a a midnight screening of Song Remains the Same, and I knew nothing of Zeppelin. Yeah. And I was a teenager, and it started at midnight, and I was like, oh, I am in hell. I want to <laughs> yeah. go to sleep so badly. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. I, I can't. I'm, I didn't drive. I can't leave. I'm stuck. And I'm there's no connection. Yeah. And, no. and then you're like. They're putting like no quarter next to another slow one. It's just like it's like it's just like oh, but I I love that film. I love that film now. 
the live stuff is great, but the in between stuff feels like it could have dungeon synth over it, and I might like it better. The live stuff wasn't very good though. The was especially but better than I mean better than the in between shit. One hundred percent. But like, what you don't like John Bonham writing like hot rods? No, and, now that and, I like. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. what, okay. You, okay. You, now we're yeah, talking more minutes. Or or uh, there's some really good sword play. Yeah. From uh, Robert, yeah. who looks really uncomfortable on a horse. <laughs> Yeah. You're like, oh, God, why yeah. did you say you'd ride a horse if you can't control it? Like, we're filming you, you moron. No, but I will say this about Song Remains the Same, where as a, as a child, as a classic rock child, um, I watched that movie and I'm like, oh, man, as much as I love yeah. Zeppelin, this movie sucks. <laughs> and then when that Led Zeppelin live DVD set came out. That's great. At the same time, my mind was blown the same way my mind was blown when Beatles Get Back came out. Yeah. Like that 68 stuff. It, oh, it just opened it up and you're like, fuck, yeah. they were the top of their game yeah. when they started. When they're facing each other. Oh, my they're like God. in a clump on a stage watching yes. each other play, like just communicating. Oh, that's incredible. You're the absolutely right. Absolute best. I was just going to say, if I was doing like a recut, I would. Do the shortened versions. You put some sketches in. Oh, definitely more <laughs> jokes. Uh, yeah, I would do shorter versions of the British invasion, the older stuff, and more studio oh, you, stuff because you're wrong. The studio, you did. the studio <laughs> stuff <laughs> reminded me of Live at Pompeii, and that's like what I wanted. So I mean, because for me, that's the mind right. blower. That's the life changer. Is right. the Pink Floyd right. Live at Pompeii. Um, uh, I also. Uh, would have wanted to figure out exactly where that Steve Martin sketch is from because I had a definitely some comedy nerd conversations again this morning be like where is this it's not Smothers I think it's on my compilation DVD I own that I probably have never gotten through but uh, uh, but yeah it is I, I would love more studio stuff I really enjoyed the studio stuff um, I, I, I like seeing the process stuff and it was like ooh again we're going to be in Live at Pompeii territory. This is fantastic. Yeah, right. like the the with the lasers and everything, just the way the show is just like that is, I mean, when I think of anything, the who, that's the first thing that pops into my mind. Yeah. Oh, Outside yeah. of Anne Margaret being in a tub of uh, baked beans sure. from the Tommy movie. <laughs> but I will that's say. That's the other thing that pops in my mind. You know, we're all young here and of the TikTok generation. Maybe we're also looking at it from that version because like part of why this blew my mind was was thinking in terms of like you were trying to say for the who sell out, but think in terms of when this would have come out. Like the amazing part is that this young super fan did a archivist it hunt is. for BBC yeah. shit that they were going to burn yes. like, and, and yep. at a time when you couldn't find any of this stuff. So it's like, Oh yeah, here's happy Jack. Like here's the, all the promo. Yeah, right. You might not want to watch it a billion times, but isn't it exciting to finally see it? Like it's like yeah. I was trying to remember how it was when, when <laughs> you didn't have access to everything, and you'd be like, "Oh my god, wait, the band I love made a video. Where can right, I yeah. watch this? I'm gonna buy some weird bullshit VHS compilation of videos just to get the one." therapy video so i could watch therapy nausea on repeat <laughs> in between a bark wow. market video or something right that's the one really brilliant thing about youtube though where the kids of today have it really easy because yeah. you had to like hunt for those music videos like now there are still some elvis costello videos that i've never seen that'll pop up for me and i'm like oh my god what is this and yeah. i and i just i get so excited watching those videos that i could find the interview footage from Lollapalooza 94 where Billy Corgan, the insufferable Billy Corgan, is talking to Yamatsuka, to Yamatsuka I from the Boredoms. And there's one oh, wow. little clip of live Boredoms that I have no idea what the record it's from. And it sounds like and he's wearing a DRI shirt and he's wearing he's wearing sun, uh, those glasses you wear when you suntan in a machine. <laughs> and it is the what like those ones that have like the tiny yes, pupil in he's the He's wearing those oh, on stage it. and it's the heaviest yeah. thing I've ever seen. Or the uh speaking of insufferable, the Thurston Moore hosted with Beck early on and Mike D 120 minutes, but where they oh. gave him license to talk about Japanese noise, and there was footage of Masana playing, and I was like, Oh my god, this is changing my life. Or what you and I both love, uh -huh. what you and I both love, the clip of uh Headbangers Ball with Alice in Chains at, at Action, Action Park. Park. 
and and yeah. the drummers wow, wearing the really? wearing the oh, nose the clips. Best. Yeah, they're all dressed up. They're being goofy. They're wearing yeah, like they're doing like all these slides and did not get hurt. They didn't get stuck in the loop the loop or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. none of them wow. got stuck in any of it's it. It's amazing. I mean, they're- all of those. That's what then. That's where me and Jason are like. Oh, this is what we share is that we both could maybe be like. Remember when Ricky was in Germany with Danzig on the Dirty Black Summer <laughs> promo? Yes, and he's wearing yes. a large shirt, and it's the same large shirt that I owned when I was 14. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, it's so funny because yeah. so much of this Who stuff is from, like, a different country. Yeah. A lot of German stuff. That German interview footage is one of my favorite things in there. Like, that, it's so Absolutely. German. And he yeah. might as well be talking to someone from Popol Vuh. Like, and he's just like, <laughs> do you understand that what you are representing is this and this and this? And then he's Mark, just like, maybe, I don't know. Get off my back. Mark, mark it down. Hour 16. Jeff he says, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> No, it's 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 intense because, you know, no one in the UK saw Tommy Smothers interview The Who oh. and, and smashes acoustic guitar. And the, and the bomb in, I don't know, do you know the story about the, the bass drum? So the, do you, yeah, do you know is, the story about the bass yeah. drum, Jeff? Yeah. Okay, well. The listener might not know. The <laughs> listener may not know. Uh, Towns, Town, Townsend didn't know that there was a bomb in there. So he got really close to it. And then Mooney kicks it to uh, set it off. And he had ear. He has ear damage to this day yeah. from that Smothers Brothers performance. Yeah, his hair is on fire. Like he's putting his hair out. Yeah. It's smoking. It should have blown off his head, honestly. Yeah. In teaching yeah. sketch and in, in, in comedy, I should have used as a reference for callback when he goes, well, that's just sloppy stage banter. Like, yes. and I was like, good move, yes. man. Like, we, yeah, I, we all, very you waited callback. just enough time in the comedic structure that we almost yeah. forgot it. We almost forgot that's he right. said, you're sloppy drumming. And then it was like, good callback. And there's a legitimate Tommy Smother, a little bit like, oh, I'm almost going to snap, but maybe not. What I loved watching about this movie, again, though, was seeing the Mooney clips and remembering just how funny I thought he was as a kid and seeing how it still stands up. That like he was so fucking funny, and you can see how missed he is now. Like from all of his, yeah. you know, like you know Harry Nilsson and Ringo and like every all of them losing Keith Moon. You know, it changed their lives. It changed their outlooks on things, and it was just nice to see. I you know this is the first time I've watched this film probably in twenty years. Me too. And that was really nice for me to see. You're right. I think it's an, um, one of the best music documentaries yeah. ever made. Hands down. Um, and th- they made another documentary recently, like in the last 20 years. The kids didn't are they? not all right. That was, yeah. <laughs> the kids are okay. No, some things are fine. But I remember it just being like, just it was just lacked the thing of surprise. It was like they knew what a music documentary was by this yeah. point. You know, they knew they knew how to tell the story. Yeah, they knew they knew like where the, what people hadn't seen what they had. You know, so that is the problem with a I lot just, of music documentaries. Was it that, that was it on. that amazing journey? That's what it was. Yeah, that wasn't even it. It just it didn't have the same feeling because kids are all right is real. And it's so real that it made me feel uncomfortable and so let and showed me something different that I never saw as a child watching this. In, in last night's watch. Could have been the melatonin. Could have been. I don't know. Could have been the melatonin, but, like, I... That's how real the film is. And, you know, The Amazing Journey, the story of The Who is just, like, a, it's a put-together, scripted, and that's when John Entwistle picked up the bass. Yeah. You know, right. like, one of those types of do- documentaries. The only thing... The only the only people you hear are, are The Who and, like, the people interviewing them. That's it. Well, what can happen yeah. with music documentaries... That fine line where you're like, wait, is this a documentary or is it essentially a, a marketing video slash a video that would play right. in a gallery if there's like the who's like art collected and then in the corner would be a video going and John Entwistle was called the ox like and you're like, yeah, that's just basic information and with footage. Boris and... the spider was an actual spider that John <laughs> Entwistle found and named and kept as a pet. Right. From 1973 to, yeah, it's like, it's basically the uh, behind the music model. Yeah. Which I love yeah. behind the music documentaries. I fucking love behind the music. Um, 
but like this is so different from that. This is its yeah. own beast. It's I, uh, I think the youth of the person putting it together definitely was essential. I also yeah. think them being really not interested in it was yep. essential. I think them being like, it's not going to be any good. We're going to say no yeah. was essential. And then them fucking loving it yeah. was also essential. Also, the fact that the kid was a fan. Yeah. That he was yeah, such absolutely. a fan. It's, it reminds me of Watch Me Jumpstart. Yeah, in the sense totally. that, like, you know, the guy that I don't even remember the guy that made the Watch Me Jumpstart, the doctor, the uh, um, uh, Guided by Voices documentary, like you, that was through a fan's lens. But it is interesting that it's stuff through in a there. fan's lens, and I'm guessing subconsciously he also was just like, I will actually show the now cliche statement of like warts and all, like he didn't yeah, complete, right. but that intercutting led to it. Uh, it weirdly didn't if you watch the full interview, it would probably come off as more dickish. Pete Townsend being like, most of our audience is thick. They don't really get what I'm talking about. But when it was <laughs> in that I little clip, love. that's a mantra. Yeah. So when it was that little clip, I, I was it. like, I hear you, brother. Like alienating through yeah. specificity. I'm with you. Like it's like sometimes you're like, yeah, but also there are a lot of little dumb sometimes. There are a lot of dumb Which is what we say on the hawk all the time. All We're the like, time. our audience is so thick. Yeah. But, but what's great about it is they know when to cut yeah. right. into something that makes you love them. Right. Like all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, well, sorry, I bought your records. Yeah. And then you're like, oh shit. That's why I bought it. It's Pete Towns and he's just he's just got a mouth and a mind and he's just gonna tell you what he thinks, you know. If McCart if McCartney was like our fans are dumb. <laughs> Which I'm sure they said. I'm sure. I know, but like publicly. But that's the shit that then in this documentary sold me more after all this time on the who. (laughs) Honestly, where I was just like, that's great, man. Like, yeah. yeah. Jason, we did it. We did it, Jason. We did it. I also really, I also really love the point where he was talking about the Beatles. Like, yeah, they sound great when they sing, but when they're not singing, (laughs) it's rubbish. (laughs) It's rubbish. (laughs) And then. If they had cut directly to Mooney with Ringo at that point, would it have even been better <laughs> oh, comic timing? Been, like, uh, do it. Oh, I will also say the one thing that really popped out for me last night, seeing mid 70s Pete Townsend to like 78, you see exactly where Eddie Vedder of today got his look. Yeah, he mm-hmm. looks like he looks exactly like Pete Townsend. He's the hair. The way he dresses. I mean, he's a huge, he's probably the world's biggest Who yeah. fan outside of like Robert Pollard. But like his look is, he is, he has modeled himself to look like 1975 Pete Townsend. And it's incredible to me. Yeah, it's incredible to me. If you could embody a member of the Who out of the four of them, and I'm not talking about like where they ended up, but I'm talking about like in your favorite era of them, who would you want to be in the Who? Hmm. Townsend. Yeah. Townsend I later. Play that as, I want to play that SG. Yeah. And what era? Leeds. Leeds. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I would walk out on you. Yeah. And Jeff would not like any of your early stuff. Yeah. No. And Jeff, you would n- not be playing any of the early stuff. No. You would I would be, be Townsend upset if you're forcing me to play any of the early stuff. Uh, <laughs> you would be Townsend sitting down knowing he's like, I'm writing the, the theme song to CSO. Yeah, 100%. Uh, wow. Because I also, I just, because I, I appreciate Townsend's voice, his singing voice, mm, and his right. lack of strength, but strength in that, like, where he's like, well, Daltrey's going to be doing that thing. Like, I'm going right. to be slightly <laughs> confident and not being confident at the same time, which feels like when I'm singing. Not screaming. Uh, yeah. When screaming, I don't care. I can do whatever. But I was just saying that's also a huge thing for the Who too that like really po- popped out for me. Like you think about Roger and Pete singing, and then you remember that John sings, but you don't usually like Barbara Ann hit me again, uh, where it was like, uh, you know, when the way they were harmonizing together, like all mm-hmm. four of them singing together was just. They're all such great singers. Jason's going to be a big yeah. Barbara Ann head so. after this. He's not going to shut up about <laughs> that performance. Yeah, There's a great 10 DVD uh, Blu-ray uh, box set of Barbara Ann outtakes <laughs> that's coming out. I feel like the person who would get picked last would be the Ox. Yeah. But I always wonder, like, what was it like being John Entwistle? 
A lot been... of drugs, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I guess, yeah. A lot, a lot of, drugs. of drugs. I mean, as a bass player, I, of course, appreciate he's an amazing player, but also that he could, like, amidst the chaos you deal with, you know, as the... As the you know, but be playing leads, but not pay, letting anyone know you're playing the lead of the song. Sometimes, yeah, and anchored, yeah, just standing there. I mean, it's, oh, it's 100%, he's yeah, pretty amazing because when he's moving so fast on the bass and he's just standing there, emotionless. Even on the Smother Brothers, he has like a look of like you dummies. Yeah, I can't yeah, believe like, what we're am doing, I doing this. Here? Yeah. What am I doing here? But he knows, he knows he looks cool, and he knows he's doing something amazing, and it's just it's a shtick. Yeah, also an amazing flugelhorn player. Because he plays that on uh, Tommy. Yeah, one of my biggest mistakes was, this was before I was in Got It By Voices and I was hanging around Pollard. I made some flugelhorn joke about the who and then realized like, oh shit, like I think I just fucked up. <laughs> like, I, think, I, think that, I think Bob's pissed that yeah. I made some offhand thing like, oh, you mean that flugelhorn band, like the French horn thingy, you know? Yeah, and he's yeah, like, yeah. He's just like, how dare you? It's perfect. It's perfect <laughs> yeah, in every way. Um, but yeah, it's cool to think about the Ox and his playing. Is he's one of the be best bassists to ever exist. Um, one thing that really po popped out for me in last night's viewing was watching Baba O'Reilly and how it just starts off and it's just Moon and Entwistle anchoring the whole thing. Yeah. While while Pete's just fucking playing around with a tambourine. Did not really consider he, Pete's know, not playing anything, but I guess it makes right. sense it, uh, until watching Yeah, he's that. just banging a tambourine until he, you know, has to hit those first big, because the impact of that sound was just so Tambourines, huge. man, just give it to someone when they just yep. need, feel like they need to do something. Or when <laughs> yep. it's Gabriel, give him a kick, too. Just let him just be yeah. like, all right, <laughs> do whatever. I feel like a jackass up here, guys. I'm going to go put a dress right, on right. soon. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. That is <laughs> Well, I always end the interview mm -hmm. with the same question for everyone, but I tailor it depending on the film we're talking about. So on a scale from one to ten, with one being the lowest and ten being the highest. This is like a survey you get off of uh you you just called Comcast. <laughs> exactly. Like, Can you do the survey after uh we do this? Well, and I don't I don't think they'll go this specific. I'd be really impressed if I okay. called Comcast we'll and they see. asked this. We'll see. So if one's the lowest and uh -huh. ten's the highest, right? How many piss stains on the Who's Next monolith do you give this film? One piss stain to ten piss stains. That's a, that's ten yeah, piss stains. Yeah, ten piss stains. I'll go ten. That's correct. Was, that's what I have written yeah, down here. Yeah. It's it is ten piss stains. That's, that's the, exactly a, right. I knew we were going to get a that. Ten piss stainer. I just knew it. <laughs> that's a they, ten piss stainer. They were at the pub for hours, and the pub's bathroom, the pub's loo was broken. <sighs> So they're just like, keep holding it. There's a monolith out back. We'll, we'll CBGB's had a better loo well, than this. <laughs> I, for so long, I never noticed that there was piss stains on that thing. I felt yeah. like such a yeah. dummy. I had the record, and then it was just like. But did you know? Here we go. <laughs> that uh, Townsend's was the only real one. The others was just uh, apparently rainwater to give the uh, effect that they had all just pissed there. They got pissed scared. You mean Mooney couldn't just, so. like, take care of all of it? Oh, just no. Like, I got already, it. He had already pissed I got it. He had a year where he didn't pee. Uh, yeah. Too many drugs. Oh. <laughs> just it just yeah. kept sucking wow. into his body. <laughs> Mooney's dry year. <laughs> I'm so glad to have you both here. Uh, this is my first double uh, guest explosion oh, well, this was and wonderful. I'm yeah, totally fantastic. honored to have you on here a big fan of all your work and oh, I will put in too. the in the show notes I will put links to uh, meet my friends of friends how to get a hold of that and the mm -hmm. best show and the hawk incredible and also I will say this if you feel underwhelmed by your typical podcast experience in terms of value 108.9 the hawk <laughs> delivers you Thank will you. not believe how much goodness you will get from the both of these people in terms of if you want to eat the meal that they're creating and dig the art they're making, you are going to be in heaven. Because I am. Thank you. Well, so, that is very I mean, kind. There's our Thank next poll so quote. Much. I love it. I'll That's take it. I love it. Put that, on the, uh, put, the, put that on the shirt. Put that on the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, guys. It was Thank great. You, Thank you, Chris. You. This was great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Revolutions Per Movie. We release new episodes every Thursday, so be sure to search for the show on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the show. And if you've enjoyed this, it would mean a lot to me if you would rate and review it as well. 
You can follow us on social media at Revolutions Per Movie and also find out more information about our various guests in the episode show notes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye.